Hi, this is Matt Stone of 180 Degree Health. Sorry, it's been a while since I've done a video. The last video we did was on fiber and, uh, you know, some interesting things about fiber. Now, one thing that I've always been a strong proponent of after actually doing some research and seeing repeated themes across the world time and time and time and time again was that there's a huge difference between refined carbohydrates and unrefined carbohydrates. Um, the question is why, and it's a very complex question, it's tough to answer, and I think our natural carbohydrate friends that have been unrefined, uh, simple things like beans and whole grains and, and uh, starches like potatoes, other root vegetables, yams, sweet potatoes, you know, these things really get a bad rap in today's world of low-carb science, and low-carb has sort of trickled its way into mainstream science and uh, you know in some regards that's a good thing because it's challenged basic assertions and beliefs and I think low carb has done a good job at pointing out the dangers of refined carbohydrates particularly white sugar and and some of the other ones that I you know personally have the biggest problem with but um, you know, as, as a lot of these these high carb, low fat type authors like uh, McDougal, Joel Furman, uh, T. Colin Campbell, you know, they've all seen this uh, miraculous impact that unrefined carbohydrates food unrefined carbohydrate foods have. And uh, legendary researchers like T. L. Cleave and Dennis Burkett, Hugh Trowell, you know, they traveled all over Africa. And they saw people on all these high fiber diets who had excellent health, they didn't have diabetes, they didn't have obesity problems, heart disease, colon cancer, uh, constipation, diverticulitis, all these different health problems that are very, very common today in the modern world. You know, these problems just weren't present there. And uh, there's, you know, the question is why? What is really the difference? Is it the vitamin and mineral content that's in the uh, unrefined carbohydrate that's stripped out? Um, or is there something altogether? Is, is it the lifestyle of the people who just so happen to be eating unrefined carbohydrates? Well, it's hard to say for sure, but you know, when you really look at the work of Weston A. Price and you look at you know, all these guys like Dennis Burkett and all the people who got to see that transition from refined carbohydrate or unrefined carbohydrate to refined carbohydrate you start to see that you know a pretty clear picture and pattern emerges and it's pretty convincing that there really is a huge difference between the two and I think Joel Furman really summed it up best when he said that it's you know it's totally unfair to put those two in the same category and I think uh, you know even some of the low carb people like Gary Taubes would also agree based on the research that he's done that there is a huge fundamental difference between refined and unrefined carbohydrates. I think he does make an attempt to, to distinguish between those two in his book Good Calories, Bad Calories and you know a lot of Good Calories, Bad Calories is based on the work of T.L. Cleave who noticed that it really didn't have anything to do with the fats. Uh, modern disease was something that was a culmination of switching over to refined carbohydrates. So I just wanted to talk about one component of unrefined carbohydrates that's fundamentally different. We talked about fiber content and uh, you know some of the myths about you know why it's you know believed to be therapeutic. Uh, it might actually be you know exert some kind of impact directly on the metabolism in general, um, and and not so much because it's bulky and filling or bulky and therefore makes your your bowels move along more quickly. It may be uh, much deeper seated reasons why it is a beneficial substance or at least that you know carbohydrates that uh, still have all their fiber intact are superior. Another is resistant starch. Resistant starch is actually very very interesting. It's basically uh, it, it's kinda like fiber in that it's indigestible and so your body has to ferment that in the, in the digestive tract and so you know, it produces all these short-chain fatty acids, uh, propionic and butyric acids, also acetic acid. These short-chain fatty acids exert a very, very powerful and well-known and well-understood impact on the metabolism. It raises mitochondrial activity, it raises the metabolism, it improves insulin sensitivity, it lowers weight, it lowers calorie intake, so it sort of brings that appetite and metabolism into balance and uh, by raising metabolism and lowering appetite and uh, you know if you want to talk about 
you know, eating less and exercising more, resistant starch and fiber and things that help produce this butyric and propionic acids in the digestive tract, you know, those are really things that actually do that automatically. And we can see that you would actually automatically have an imbalance between metabolism and appetite if you were to subsist off of refined carbohydrates, uh, particularly sugars, which don't have any resistant starch, and refined sugar, which has all of its fiber removed. So there's a huge fundamental difference between unrefined and refined carbohydrates. And resistant starch is definitely one of those things. You can read more about resistant, resistant starch at resistantstarch.com. And it's a little bit geared up towards this new product that's been released called High Maze. High Maze is a type of, you know, it's basically formulated a variety of corn that's indigestible and they're trying to add it to foods, add it to baked goods and things like that so that people will get this resistant starch uh, and they won't get the same kind of glycemic explosion that they might get from white flour or something like that. So I don't know if that's really the, should be the take home message or not, but uh, you know there's several different kinds of resistant starch and there's some that you don't have to go online and buy some special product seek it out and start adding it to your baked goods you can get resistant starch just from eating things like basmati rice which is uh, the variety of rice that's highest in amylose which is the least digestible of the common starches found in foods um, and then you have beans which are and legumes which are naturally very high in resistant starch whole grains are naturally higher in resistant starch than refined grains and uh, you know, root vegetables and things like that. However, uh, there's a type of resistant starch called resistant starch 3 or RS3 that you actually get by cooking a starch and then letting it cool after you've cooked it. So that's kind of a fascinating thing, but you know, if you like a chilled potato salad or something like that, that's a great way to turn something into, uh, you know, manufacture resistant starch in your home kitchen you know, getting into the habit of eating a, a salad like that. I've actually included a recipe in the latest 180 Kitchen that I just finished revising with a salad that's, you know, designed to be really high in that type of resistant starch, RS3, and it's called the RS3 salad, and it's a chilled potato salad with beans and whatnot, and, you know, I, I don't know what kind of miraculous impacts this will have if people will actually increase the resistant starch in their diet and notice this tremendous effect and weight loss and a rise in body temperature and all the things that that we're after at 180 degree health or not but uh, you know the evidence on it is very interesting and it's something that I think should be on people's radar screens and uh, it's kind of you know a, a different type of fiber that uh, you know is probably better than fiber with less of the bloating and gas and negative side effects that you get from you know, fiber, especially insoluble fiber. So anyway, that's resistant starch. And that's it for me today. Thanks again. This is Matt Stone of 180 degrees.